Stolen artifacts, a web of lies, international black marketeering. The story has basically everything you could want from an action story, except the action sequences. Hello and welcome. I'm Zilla, and this is my Athenaeum. Today we'll be following up on my previous mention of a papyrus scandal in the classics world. The case of the stolen Sappho. Although, really, it's just as much, if not more so, the case of the stolen first century fragment of Mark. In 2014, there was a sudden announcement. A scrap of papyrus had revealed a never-before-seen poem by Sappho. Sappho was a poetess of the ancient Greek world, who had such skill and grace in writing that Plato referred to her as the Tenth Muse. Unfortunately, most of her work is lost to us today. It comes down in quotations from other authors, in scraps of papyrus found in ancient Egyptian garbage dumps and reused as mummy wrappings. Any new find, especially one this big, is a monumental occurrence. The new papyrus was something of a mystery. Very few people had seen it in public, and Dirk Aubink, a papyrologist and Hellenist at Oxford University, was the only person who really knew where it had come from. But there was a professional quality photograph published, and Aubink found himself vying with the great Martin West, a late giant of comparative linguistics and Greek poetry studies, to be the first to publish an edition for the academic public. Aubink won, and the new poem, now known as the Brothers Poem, entered academic discourse as P. Saf Aubink. Once the text was available, scholars gathered online to discuss and dissect it. Was the transcription as accurate as it could be? Were we sure that it was Sappho? Could we be sure it was genuine? What would it tell us about Sappho, her life, and her poetry? As I mentioned in my previous video, one of the main ways we determined this to be genuine Sappho was some of the verb forms, which were aeolic in a style never before found, but predictable from the patterns of the linguistics. There were other pieces of evidence, such as some of the content particular to Sappho and her life, uh, confluences with other extant fragments of poetry. In general, it's unlikely to have been a forgery. But there was one other troubling question, one that came up again and again, and one that Abink never really answered. Where had the papyrus come from? Provenance, or the history of location and sale of an artifact from antiquity, isn't generally as important to a scholar of classical texts as it would be to, say, an archaeologist or an art historian, but Provenance can be really important. Just like in the sciences, it's important for classical scholars to be able to replicate each other's work, especially with such a unique find. And the ethics of poorly provenanced artifacts, especially those that don't wind up in the public eye, can be particularly grim. War and chaos engender a lot of looting, and Private collectors, who don't care much for historical context, can end up endangering not only our chance to understand the past better, but also the lives of those who live and work near the site where it was found. Many artifacts passed through Nazi hands, or from sites that had their guards killed so that looters could make a quick buck. As for P. Saf Abink, the papyrus itself, it vanished into a private collector's gallery. We still don't know where it is. So for provenance, we really have only Abing's word to go on, and his word has been confusing and contradictory. First, he claimed that he had seen it in a private gallery's collection when he'd been invited in to discuss some fragments found during a dissection of a mummy's cartonage, the wrappings and mask. Later, he claimed it came in sort of a... a book-binding mass of papyrus, something more commensurate with the first century dating of the papyrus. But the only evidence he offered was a sale lot number from Christie's, the auction house, and people who know more about the antiquities black market than I do say that's not very convincing evidence of a provenance. 
Recently, the sale brochure from Christie's was published, and the analysis of the photographs there doesn't line up with either of Abing's stories. Things took a strange turn when it was noticed by scholars that the Christie's lot number was the same as that referenced by the Green family, owners of Hobby Lobby, in reference to some of the papyrus entered into their fundamentalist pet project, the Museum of the Bible. Those scraps of papyrus were already identified as a, co a collection of both Sappho fragments and fragments of the Gospel of Mark. It turns out that they were identified and examined by none other than Dirk Obink at the invitation of the Greens. The Greens had already been in trouble with the U.S. Department of Justice and had had to settle over looted antiquities. And Obink's obvious connection to the Greens collection is not what they call a good look. But it wasn't until 2019 that the scandal really broke. First, the Greens publicly admitted and produced emails indicating that they had purchased that first century mark from Obink himself. And the Egypt Exploration Society, or EES, published a statement saying that the first century mark and Sappho fragments had been stolen from their collection, probably by the general editor, Dirk Abink. The EES had disinvited Abink from his editorial position as early as 2015, after the publication of that suspicious Sappho poem. In 2019, Abink was suspended from Oxford after his arrest based on the accusations of theft. He still denies any wrongdoing to this day, but whoever did take those papyri, they knew exactly what they were doing. Not only did they remove the papyri from the Sackler Library at Oxford, they also took all of the reference cards from the physical index, and the removal was only proved by the backup electronic records that were rarely checked. Rare book, manuscript, and map theft is almost always perpetrated by privileged men who have been entrusted with precious collections and feel entitled to the money that they can get by mishandling them. It's been called the oldest, whitest, malest of crimes. Abink has been, of course, very cagey about his involvement in the papyrus sale, the Greens collection, and denies any wrongdoing, but his reputation, briefly cemented by the publication of a new Sappho poem, has plummeted as more and more scholars understand the weight of what he allegedly has done. As for scholars working on Sappho, the question remains, how do we handle this new text? Surely a genuine Sappho. Can we publish on it, given our ethical objections to a morally ambiguous origin in an inaccessible papyrus? Or are we obligated not to publish, denying the classical world and our understanding of history new evidence? I still don't know. But I do know that the oldest, whitest, and malest of crimes has got to go. Keep learning, friends. <laughs> <laughs>